we are launching. So on behalf of Tamil Nadu Science Forum and Popular Science Lecture Group, I extend my warm welcome to you all. So today we are going to uh, launch the program of Meet the Scientists. This is not new to PSL group. Uh, we have already done that a couple of times, but the, it was a direct meeting with the scientists. So this is going to be a virtual meeting. Uh, so the, uh, with regard to the PSL, PSL activities were expanded and uh, now it is the second such activities we are getting into that. We have already conducted some 48 lectures. So we gain a lot of experience on uh, conducting such lectures and the growing demand for such lectures is more. So uh, again, when we are having a conference of the PSL group, so we have inducted some 45 uh, students and academicians into the now it is the second such activity. We already conducted some 48 lectures. So we gain a lot of experience. Some kind of uh, yeah. echo is I'm hearing. Uh, okay, go ahead. It's my yeah. Okay, okay. So we gain a lot of experience uh, during our 48 lectures, and we uh, after that we conducted an. Um, conference we inducted some 45 members in our ec most of them are students and academicians so there was a lot of uh, other activities uh, as uh, uh, was proposed in the meeting uh, one such activities uh, is the uh, meet the scientist program we also have a um, program to bring out newsletters and uh, workshop for rice science writing so many things are exciting things are waiting and this is the second thing which we are launching today so with regard to the PSL, PSL was uh, part of Tamil Nadu Science Forum. Which, um, before I start introducing the PSL, let me uh, say something about the Tamil Nadu Science Forum. <laughs> Tamil Nadu Science Forum is a voluntary organization. It was started in 1980 by a group of um, uh, research scholars in Madras University. So, um, so yeah, uh, and they started conducting some uh, hall meetings. Um, after five, six years, you know, it went ahead and uh, extending its activities throughout Tamil Nadu. And it also exta ex also exta expanding the activities apart from the uh, hall meeting, conducting hall meetings. It, it went into uh, organizing the, the literacy MUMA literacy program, total literacy program. Tamil Nadu Science Forum was for part of the total literacy program. It also worked for the women empowerment and women in science. In that, it also work, uh, work in various other areas. It start publishing books, start publishing magazines. So many activities has come up. Now it has been refined in six um, different verticals. You know, all the activists of Tamil Nadu Science Forum are part of the one of the six uh, verticals which I am going to tell now. The first activity is the science propagation, and the second activity is the science publication, and third activity is the environment uh, study of environment. Uh, and development and the fourth activity is youth for science and fifth activity is the science publication uh, and sixth activity is the sum of what we call equal equality the gender equality so these are all the six active uh, verticals under which all the science activists are working in interior district you no know, i see a lot of volunteers in some um, um, the book public uh, the science writings um, so many uh, things, but in Chennai, we are focusing more on science propagation, particularly we are focusing on higher science. So that is the way the science, science, Tamil Nadu Science Forum is working and uh, the membership annual membership fee is uh, 30 rupees. Uh, each district, we have the district unit and we have a state level body, which have an uh, executive committee and uh, as well as the general body. Uh, in district also, we have a general body, we have an um, executive committee and we, are, we have also branches. So each branch is taking care of all the six activities. PSL is one such branch. We are mainly focusing on propagation of science. So PSL came into picture in 2018 uh, after the demise of Stephen Hawking. So we started with the Stephen Hawking's memorial lecture. That was our PSL one. And we started conducting various meetings, uh, various lectures uh, under the banner of PSL. Particularly, we are focusing more on uh, the Nobel Prize lectures. Every year, uh, we we used to conduct three lectures on Nobel Prizes, three different branches of science. You know, we used to conduct the lectures. Uh, um, so uh, from 2008 onwards up to 2000, 
lectures we have conducted. During the pandemic period, we have conducted almost uh, 12 lectures on COVID-19. So the part of that, the, whatever the ongoing research and the interesting research, so we uh, bring it to the PSL uh, lectures. The PSL has gone into many colleges and the college teachers and professors start demanding to conduct the program in their colleges. And we also did many programs in Madras Christian College. So the last program was done a month back and it was it was on physics, the trend in the development in physics. That was the theme of the last conference, one day conference was held in Madras Christian College. So with that, let me uh, um, let me close the remarks about the TNSF and BSL and uh, uh, hand over the mic to um, uh, Dr. Subhashti Deshikan. She is going to introduce the speaker and the speaker is going to talk about maybe 20 to 30 minutes and the audience can chat with the speaker. So with that, we are going to um, conclude and uh, uh, the whole aim of this exercise is to uh, bring the students and scientists uh, uh, in one single platform and ask them to exchange their views. And what we expect uh, the outcome of the meeting is uh, we want to form a study, a study group on a particular topic, particularly maybe in neuroscience. Uh, some people can form as a group and start, uh, start studying from scratch and they can get guidance from uh, scientists like Sandhya. So they can develop their knowledge in the specific area. So Dr. Sandhya Kaushika is a cellular neurobiologist who ran a lab first at NCBS TIFR Bangalore and now she is at uh, Department of Bi Biological Sciences at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. She received the HHMI Early Career Scientist Fellowship in 2012. She collaborates widely with physicists, chemists and engineers to study problems in cellular neurobiology. I have also written about her work in the Hindu, where she has spoken about, uh, where, where she has uh, told me about traffic jams in the brain. So that's a kind of fascinating thing that she does. Most recently, her work has been featured in an article titled, Women in Neuroscience, Four Women's Contributions to Science and Society, published in Frontiers of Integrated uh, Neurosciences Journal uh, in, on 26 January. She has also engaged in community building activities like organizing the first two young investigators meeting and the first Indian Sea Elegance meeting. Sea Elegance is a worm, I think, that uh, biologists are very fond of. It's the typical uh, animal used for studying various things. So she has organized the first Indian meeting on Sea Elegance, expand expanding the NCBS crash and training and mentoring people working at the crash and COVID-19 related science outreach, about which I know a lot. Uh, trainees from her lab have gone on to a variety of careers in academics, industry, science communication, science editing and entrepreneurship. Uh, Dr. Sandhya Kaushika is an excellent speaker and I invite her now to give her talk. But before that, we will give five minutes to Pugar Arasan, who will uh, describe uh, he has some experience with organizing and coordinating a study circle. After her talk, uh, Dr. Sandhya will also give uh, some hints as, as to study material that uh, can be used. So he will say how they have put uh, such material to a good use in the earlier program. Well, can you take some few minutes to tell that? One, yes. Single, yes. one announcement, uh, the, the number of seats has reached 100. And we have the capacity of 100 and the remaining people should join the YouTube. And we'll be placing the YouTube link in the chat box and who, whoever is dropping from the meeting, if they are not able to come back to the meeting, they can just go to the YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you uh, for the time. Uh, uh, thank you, Vijayan, sir, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, Sandhya, ma'am, for spending uh, her time with us. So uh, uh, just a brief word about what we did. So um, I'm, I'm a physicist, <laughs> actually. I, I'm doing my, uh, I'm in grad school right now for physics. And what we did with the study circle, with the Saha study circle was in our undergrad, 
it started after uh, Dr. Saravanan's uh, Meet the Scientist program, uh, which uh, we had in 2020, January, if I remember, January or February, if I remember correctly. And then COVID struck, so we had to go online. So uh, it was. It started with just me and a couple of friends. Uh, we were interested in uh, learning general relativity, which uh, Dr. Saravanan uh, had explained to us in, in the talk and also in the Meet the Scientist. Uh, program where we had a lot of questions for him and uh, we kind of wanted more answers and uh, preferably also questions that we can sort of work on uh, for research. So uh, it started there and uh, we started by first asking for resources, asking the PhD students, the grad students that we know for resources and then just talking amongst ourselves and I think that was the most important thing about uh, the study groups is that you get to have conversations, uh, plunk, uh, research relations with your own uh, colleagues and classmates, and that can take you to places. And uh, we used to have meetings every week or so, uh, where we would just discuss whatever we had learned over that uh, week, and whatever problems we had uh, solved, and whatever problems we had <laughs> while solving the problems, which was arguably more, which is good. Um, and there was also a traditional uh, lecture uh, Q&A type uh, sessions that we would have where one person would come up with a topic which they are reading up, which they are interested in working in right now, and they would present it to the rest of the group. And uh, we would have questions and we would have a discussion right after it. So I think the most valuable things is uh, I personally am a very confused person. I do not know which research direction I should head into. When I was in my undergrad, I wanted to do astrophysics. Uh, right now I'm doing condensed matter, which is complete opposite. So uh, I think for me, if anything, it really helped me identify my interests first and foremost, where, where I feel uh, home at mostly. And uh, I have a lot of friends and so, some of them are not even uh, from here, I should say. Since we went online and since we opened it up to everyone, I actually met a few people from Germany. <laughs> and that was quite interesting because we got to talk about how the programs work in Germany and eventually I got here. So there's that. Um, and also, I would say it, it helped me uh, develop a lot of soft skills, which I feel are very, very important for research, which are quite lacking in a traditional classroom setting like the ability to be able to talk about uh, what you feel is right, at least from what you've read, and to be able to answer questions in a seminar, which I, which I found very daunting, but I feel like it's, it's a very necessary part of training to be a, a uh, scientist. And above all, I would say, uh, studying the literature, learning how to learn, those are some of the things that I learned uh, during the uh, study group sessions that we would have, and we're still functioning. Uh, right now, so it's been, I think, very pleasant, I think, one and a half years at this point. So, yeah, I uh, really hope uh, that you, know, you guys are able to form a study group and uh, wish you all the best for your research. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Pugar. Uh, that was a very interesting uh, uh, introduction to study groups and your experience of it. Now, I will not uh, uh, carry in asking Sandhya to come and present her talk now. Following which you can now give your questions. You can either put it in the chat box or in the YouTube uh, link and they will be uh, taken and uh, presented to Dr. Sandhya. Yes, Sandhya. Can't hear you, Sandhya. Can you hear me now? Yes, now okay, I can. I hear just you. hadn't unmuted myself. There is no doing things electronically. I say thanks, Akhilashri. Very nice introduction. Thank you, Vijayan, and thank you for the description of the study group. Um, it was really nice to hear that. So I sort of divided my talk into two parts because one part I thought it's so a neuroscience or neurobiology, whichever way you think about. Is a very, very vast area. You look all the way from, you know, single molecules, looking at how ion channels function, all the way to, you know, behavior, um, 
depression, mood disorders, um, you know, neurodivergents who may see who may have ADHD or dyslexia. So it covers the whole span of biology. It's very large and it's very difficult to sort of cover it all even in say a series of five or six lectures. So what I thought I would focus on today is to really think of neurons in cell, as cells. But what I thought through this talk I would also do, which is the second part of my talk, is to give you a small window into how people answer questions. And I've picked a very simple problem of traffic jam, which is very usually very accessible uh, and easy to understand to do that. So let's get started. So the first question that we all need to ask ourselves if we are scientists is why should we bother studying the brain? And I think the answer for why can be anything from, oh, I know it sounds cool, but usually that and this is very important to figure out for ourselves or it's interesting in some way, but there are very practical reasons why we study the brain. Our ability as animals in this universe, and this is not just limited to human beings, but many animals, depends on our ability to sense the world around us. So the brain, as we know it, controls and is part of perception, thought, and action. Very simple, I'm showing you three pictures. I think all of you will recognize that this is a beautiful picture of the sun. We will not know if it's sunrise or sunset, but we have it. Here's a cartoon where you know that at the first place you stay, that's what this picture is. Here is a person having some food in the morning newspaper. For me, always this is the coffee picture. Right? So you also know when you, you perceive the picture, you have some thought in my case, it's like, oh my god, why is it orange juice? Coffee is the better. Or some action uh, that you will take, which is say, you know, at this moment I need to go to work, so I need to walk to, you know, walk outside the house and so on and so forth. This ability of sensing information is not only thing which is outside of ourselves, which is what I described now. So, right, how you're seeing these pictures and recognizing what those pictures are, or if you see a beautiful flower, uh, then you say, oh, that's a beautiful flower. Or you can see that I'm wearing a uh, black shoe if you're, if you're looking at me. But you can also sense what is internal to us, like this picture says, pain, hunger. So the nervous system is central to get that sort of information in the environment that we are exposed to, whether it's inside us or outside. <laughs> but there's a very important other reason to study the brain. And I'm showing you one picture. I already mentioned uh, ADHD, dyslexia, depression, schizophrenia, which are various neurodevelopmental or neuropsychiatric disorders. But there's also a very important aspect of studying the brain, which we as humans on this planet are increasingly going to face as we have aging con uh, aging population, is neurodegenerative disease. There's a very large number of people, if you live long enough, you're all going to face dementia. But here the picture I'm going to show you is of this baseball player called Lou Gehrig, who has a neurodegenerative disease called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. But all of you would have also heard of Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. What happens with Lou Gehring and is also with people who get amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or some of these other diseases is that the neuromuscular junctions stop to work and you essentially become wheelchair bound and you breathe because your muscles can move when you take oxygen into your lungs. And eventually these people, that muscle will also stop moving. That means they have to be on the ventilator to be kept alive. So these are pretty terrible diseases as well. And they attack and they, because of deficits in the nervous system. So there are very many important reasons why we all need to be sort of interested and engaged with the brain. 
and with the many functions that the brain does. There are many ways in which you can study the nervous system. Of course, I gave you examples which are largely to do with humans. But some the way you approach problems in biology, you can't cut up humans and do sort of invasive experiments. That's not ethical. And it, those experiments may not even be ethical if you want to look at a, a monkey. But there are a variety of model systems that people use to understand questions in neuroscience. They could, for instance, many of the seminal discoveries were made using a squid, which is a basically lived in the sea, or the frog. Um, they have been, of course, things like rat, which have been used for how uh, animals sort of sense space, or even some little creature that is sea elegant, which I will show you a movie of later on. Uh, which have been used to say, how do animals smell? So these various sensory modalities of movement, of smell, of perception, are all studied in different model systems, all of which have informed us about how the nervous system functions, and therefore illuminated how we might address not only fundamental understanding of the nervous system, but what might go wrong when you have injuries or you have neurodegenerative diseases or neurodevelopmental diseases or uh, neurodevelopmental disorders or neuropsychiatric disorders. So hold on to that thought. So many of you at some point in your life would have seen some picture like this. And this I have just pulled out from a textbook in Google. And this comes actually from the Allen Institute in Seattle in the US. And what you see when you look at the nervous system, and this is, of course, a human being, but if you look at any organism, you'll see something similar. You, the, you see these wired-like information, wired-like structures, which essentially cover pretty much the entire body. Right? There is no part of the body which is not covered with neurons. In fact, for instance, your fingertips have a lot of nerve endings, and which also have, therefore, ability to sense many stimuli the fingertip they're very very highly sensitive for instance compared to say somewhere else on your heart so the underlying substrate of the nervous system of which the brain is part is actually cells which are interconnected with each other that form wired circuits and here's a picture of this wired circuit which is sense information <coughs> integrate information and transmit information I'll come to an example of the reflex arc, which everybody pretty much studies in school, sometimes between the fifth and the ninth or tenth standard, or is a lived experience where we, you know, we bang our elbow and again, it, you know, it'll really hurt a lot, right? And you immediately recognize that you have to withdraw your hands because you've hurt. So I'll come to that example later, which is an illustration of a wired kit, what is the wired circuit. But the same cell in the nervous system, including the brain, which is very important, not the larger part, the other cells, but the central cell which is able to do this sense information and transmit information are neurons. And I'm going to now jump right into the cell biology of neurons. And this beautiful picture, the fiction, shows you that neurons come in many, many different shapes. They are complex in structure. Some of them can be very long. So for instance, from your spinal cord to your big toe, there's a neuron that is that long. If you think about giraffes or elephants, they're even longer. So the spinal cord to big toe is typically about a meter or more. Right? And that is the length. So if you actually stub your toe, if you hit your, thumb, uh, your big toe somewhere, you will immediately know you hit yourself, right? And it is through this long wire that information is passed. And this complex structures are often very, very important for collecting information and conveying information. The neuron sort of divides into two parts, the receiving information, although this is a <laughs> sort of a simplification, but still it's a useful simplification. You have receiving information which is highlighted here in blue, 
that information even in a single cell is integrated before information travels down to give a next impulse to the next neuron or a muscle. So the sense integrate transmit is not only a property of the circuit, it's a property of nearly every single neuron that is present, where the integration takes place in the main cell body from which these processes can emanate. These dendrites, which are called sample space and sample information from a large area, and you can also, as you see, send out information to various places through us. Because neurons come in different shapes, you also have to support and give them structural integrity and allow these multiple forms to have function. And this is very, very central to how the nervous system functions. Because of that interest, people started looking at neurons much more carefully. I would say the first major effort, and it's part of actually the study circle that I'm going to suggest in the, for the later part, is actually two, neuro, two people who got the Nobel Prize. One of them was Antago Ramon Kahar, who used G, who got the Nobel Prize with him, Mesmer, to look at how neurons look under the microscope or looked, I know, tried to see what you saw under the microscope, which allowed you to magnify structures and see what the morphology or what the shapes of various structures were. And in fact, Ramoni Kahan, and if you go back to my first slide, has these beautiful drawings which come from his experiment you know, in the late 1800s, and I think it was in the early 1900s that he got this. So using microscopic techniques and looking inside neurons, you see what you see, we just peel it back and you look and you see a lot of different things. You see all of these structures, you might not know it's really when you first looked at it. But these are things which are present, these organelles are things which are present inside cells. And this is what are called structural elements or the cytoskeleton. We'll dwell on that a little bit further on. So you could now see a lot of details which are present inside neurons after you realize that neurons come in all these different shapes. In fact, the current state of understanding tells you that this cytoskeleton which is depicted by these green lines here, which are called microtubules, or cellular rows, or actin, which can also form short cellular rows, but are increasingly being recognized as part of the membrane periodic skeleton in the cell, may actually hold up the neuron and give it the structural integrity as it extends all of these arbors from the single cell body. Because you need that stable structure to be present. At this point, usually if I am in a live audience, I'll say, how many of you have grandparents who are living? You know, people, or how many of you know people who are in the 80s or 90s who are still breathing? That means these neurons are still functioning, right? They are able to move the diaphragm muscle. The person is breathing. The person is hopefully able to do the activities of daily living, are able to recognize and talk to you, which means this structure of the neuron is actually stable, long-lasting, and still able to function several decades into a person's life. And therefore, and these don't, neurons don't turn over like other cells. You know, skin cells, they fall, new ones will come. Neurons, most of them, what you're born with and what you modulate is what you have. You only lose them. You don't add a significant number. So there is a lot of um, evolutionary pressure, I would say, or a need to maintain your neurons and neural structures. I think so. What we also know, this receive information then 
and the faces that send, send the information, which is axon, so have slightly different sides for architecture. For instance, these kind of ring-like membrane periodic structures with the polymer actin is present largely in the axon, but has not really been seen in the dendron. So you know that there are differences in the collection, information collection either, compared to the information sending out. So then there becomes a series of questions that arise from it. How does that happen? Why is it like that? And those are the kinds of questions that scientists are really excited about. And I'll come to one tiny part of how scientists ask questions a little bit later. So you can look at microtubules, and microtubules are these long polymers along which various organelles, and most of you have heard of mitochondria, which is, um, which is the powerhouse of the cell and gives energy, move along these microtubules. Likewise, there are other kinds of organelles. One of them is called synaptic vesicles, or precursors of them, which also move along these tracks. And in fact, you can look again using microscopy, and you see these very complex my microtubule architectures. There are large numbers of them. They seem to have things which are sort of attached with them. And this kind of microscopy gives you a wealth of information about how the inside of the neuron is organized, which is important for moving material as well as structural integrity. And here's an example of how the membrane periodic skeleton looks like. And you can see these periodic rings. Maybe here it's a little bit clearer. You have these periodic links along the axon, but not really along the dendrites, which are over here. And this is summarized to be how that periodic actin ring arranged, are arranged with some sort of molecular border between them facing them. Okay. So these are just examples of how microscopy, high-end microscopy, electron microscopy, super-resolution microscopy, just regular microscopy can inform you about how the cells are laid out, what their connections to each other are, and what their innards look like, or how they look like. So let's come back to the wired circuit response. I've sort of said that neurons come in many shapes, and they each neuron functions to sense information and transmit information, right? Sense, integrate, and transmit. Likewise, the circuit also does the same. Right? For instance, I told you about the reflex arc already. If you bang yourself, you know you hit yourself. You have the sensory information. It will go to your spinal cord, which is part of your nervous system, and go through an intermediate neuron, which is often called an interneuron. Then goes out saying, if, the, if it pains a lot, then you have to remove your leg immediately from that stimulus. And so your motor neuron will make you move your leg, or through that you will move. Or might have not banged it very badly, or you might decide, no, I have to keep my leg where it is, and you might say, get some more input and say, I'm not moving. Right? So this wired circuit is what responds to the stimuli. And what happens, and I just wanted to tell you one thing, because it's going to come again as part of the study time, when you have this kind of information processing happening, one of the key features of the nervous system is the speed at which we can respond. If we hurt ourselves, we'll immediately withdraw our finger or toe or whichever part, right? Because it's, it's very, very fast. We're not like burning ourselves or injuring ourselves for a while and then we remove it. So although there are people who have errors in their channel and cannot feel pain, but typically noxious stimuli or pain stimuli, we will do that. If the sun is very bright, we will try to shut our eyes and shade ourselves. So in multiple sensory stimuli, our responses are very fast. And those responses do not come just from this underlying cytoskeletal structure that I said. What comes from is electrical signaling, which occurs through channels which are present here, which pass ions. And here is an example of how if you stick a little electrode or a wire inside a neuron, you can actually see current passing. And that is why it can be very fast, because current can pass very fast from one area of the cell to the other area of the cell. There is integration that takes place here. 
and then finally that electrical information comes to the end of the neuron where you have chemicals released from synaptic receptors which are called neurotransmitters which then go on to tell the other cell okay you are now stimulated do your job okay so i wanted you to think of neurotransmission or communication in a neuron as occurring at various time scales of various levels some which are very fast which are electrical and some which are slower where cargo move along microtubule track and some which is also very fast which is release of neurotransmitter at the release of neurotransmitter at terminals is very very central to neuronal function or every single neuron's function and typically you have a lot of vesicles called synaptic vesicles which are filled with neurotransmitters which are basically chemicals of various kinds and once the electrical information comes here they will all move to the membrane or a lot of them will move to the membrane typically in this region and release their content and this will then stimulate the other neuron which is just the posterior so these wired circuits that we have talked about which have electrical speedy transmission also have chemical communication hub which bring which occur through synaptic vesicles which are filled with here so that's the basic layout of how the nervous system functions i will stop here and i before i move to the next part of my talk i would love to take some questions and briefing that not here something like that i'll stop presenting i'll wait for a few minutes people can ask me questions because the next part of the talk is now going to go into what i consider how do you problem solve if you have a question in science how do you go about answering it and that comes as an illustrative example for neuro cell biology problem for my open class so i've sort of given you an overview any questions at all i'm happy to take them up. If anyone has a question, you can uh, signal it, or you can ask. Uh, uh, oh, you can yourself. put it in the chat box. Yeah, you can put it in the chat box also, or you can unmute yourself and ask. Actually, one question occurred to me, Sandhya. Can I ask you yeah. that? So you mentioned that there are two types of uh, responses. One where the cells res the response is immediate because of the electrical uh, connection. Two types of information transfer right. in neurons. So the when are these uh, two types used? Uh, They are used all the time. So the electrical information. So when you have a neurotransmitter release. Okay. when you have neurotransmitter release they will go on and bind to neurotransmitter receptors and they will open channels eventually which change to leads to changes in ionic um, ionic balance this ionic balance change is what travels very quickly in terms of you know basically electricity flow inside neuron but this has to happen at many many places and so the cell body has to integrate that information and decide okay here is where we can actually make you know we can decide we need to fire so you cross a certain threshold now you fire and go down the axon and now release again some neurotransmitter so both happen you have the electrical signaling pathway being very very important for doing things like integration of information and the chemical synaptic vesicle release at synapses and this is the gen it, it is it is accurate but it is a simplification because you can have electrical synaptic synapses but that chemical release at synapses is very important to then start the electrical signal in the downstream or the next cell that it talks to i i have one quick question uh, what what's the firing voltage and what's the ampere age maybe a microamps kind of stuff right very small yeah very small microamps is much much smaller than that you're looking okay. at very very small cut mm. 
and those small currents are basically just differences in ion so what you have thresholds for summation are very low and when you have that current come to the center, uh, to the synapse you release a lot of neurotransmitter essentially through collecting a lot of ions over there because what happens is that there is an ionic change in ion which forces certain channels to open less in calcium and all of the very elevated levels of calcium because now you are in the micromolar range for calcium will cause vesicles no, no, I'm so not a basically I'm an automation engineer what we use to transmit the signal is no it's a standard signal 4 to 20 milliamps or 1 to 5 volt kind these of stuff are, these are like, so do you have such like, trans yeah, transmitters yeah, as yeah, such yeah, standard these are no only ampere very very you know, I know, I know. The million, what is the range it of this uh, signal? It varies depending on the neuron. And I would say it varies upon the diameter of the neuron. And I'll have to look up to tell you the exact numbers because that's not something that can be no, is there, no, I, I don't want the number. Is there any standard ra range? I want to say, the, I could be wrong. I, I don't want to say, anywhere okay. between 0.1 to maybe 2, 3 milliamps, but I could be wrong. Okay, okay. That's correct. <laughs> That's what I want because it should be in, in your brain. Uh, the 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 nuclear tides must be having uh, a ca um, specific potential to accept. Now, if it is minimum, it will not say uh, react. Minimum, anything. it will not be conducting. Yeah. yeah. So maximum, it be, if, if it crosses maximum, that's all going to happen. But there is a lot of diversity in this, and I think okay. that's something that we should recognize uh, simply because what you actually. Neurons, as I say, come in many shapes and many sizes. Some neurons have insulations, others do not. Therefore, all of these things begin to vary depending on the group of okay, okay, And that, okay. that is what makes it both beautiful and difficult. So, so conduction velocities can vary from 0.4 meters per second all the way to 120 meters per second. Okay, one more question. That's such a large range, not even in the same order. Sir, can we, can we take some of the questions from the audience? They are posting, then maybe we can come back to your question again after sure, that. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. PR Vignesh has a question. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask Vignesh? Or shall I read it out? Maybe Vignesh is questioning. Read uh, it out. And if he has maybe. a follow up, he can. Yeah. Uh, he asked, ma'am, how was information stored? How can neurons that only transmit signals store them? So that's a completely different process, right? So we have memories, for instance, are stored. Those often, if you have long-term memories stored, they often require protein synthesis. In fact, you as an individual would have the same experience with me. If you just look at something once, like studying for exam, and if it's you will not necessarily remember it 10 days after that. You study it for the exam, it's gone from the day. So repeated exposure, things which you learn multiple times or exposed to many times, what that information moves from different parts of the brain and eventually you have protein synthesis take place and the idea is that you change the morphology of the connections and you encode that information in that manner. So it, what I described is an immediate thing and what this requires is a different time scale altogether. And this is also work done by a Nobel laureate called Eric Kandel. And it's very, very beautiful work. We actually showed that memories form and are stored due to protein. Vignesh, that's the answer to your question. Would you like to ask any further follow-up questions on that? Any further doubts? You can type in the chat box if you want. Okay. No, you're, you're, he's fine with that. So, uh, the other question is uh, Shankar Narayanan asking how sympathetic and parasympathetic so systems can So, they control different understood. kinds of functions, but you would realize that it doesn't matter if you're a sympathetic system or parasympathetic system, whether you're a C. elegans or a rat or a human being or a bat. Individual neuron essentially has very common principles which I have what I have described. What the output is, that is which neurons it connects with or which other cells it connects with, its morphology and therefore what information it gets and 
how big it is, how you know that whether it's insulated or not, will control properties like what is the conduction velocity, how much how much uh, do you need to depolarize to get an output which is going to depend on what kind of channels you have on the membrane, which is how much ionic current will flow. In fact, one of the questions I ask when I teach, what happens if you don't have this channel? Will you still have an ability to transmit information along the wire? Right? So the underlying principles still hold true. And the differences between them depend on where they are where they are present, their shape, their insulation, where they get input from, and what that what they spin up. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Mahim Dave. As you mentioned about reflex action, why does it happen to be that only if we are hit at a certain point in the elbow, reflex action occurs? And not by hitting a random point. Are there any defined connection, connection conditions and neuron networks associated with reflex actions? So, not really. It is the network that I showed you. The point is how many neurons are present. So, if you have a large number of neurons in that information, and in fact, the slide in which I showed you the electrical trace. The point of the slide actually is to show that you need multiple neurons firing to have an output. So in that location, which is most sensitive, you have a large number of neurons, large number of nerves that are able to get that information. In, if, it's not as if, if you hit yourself in other places, you don't feel it. You feel it, but you don't feel the pain, right? And the, what's missing is the particular kind of neuron and the density of neurons is what is missing. It's not a different thing. Still the same thing. Okay. One more question after which we can come back to uh, Vijayan sir's question. Uh, oh. Sir, maybe if you're uh, going to drop out, maybe you could uh, just ask the question now, sir. Yeah, I, I posted my question here. So yeah. basically, you mean about stroke, will they regain function? Yeah, right, yeah. Right. So um, when people have stroke, there is, of course, damage. And that is why many times that they will tell you that you need to, soon after stroke, you need to sort of pull the brain and you need to dissolve the clot and try to restore it as quickly as possible. So you will have the smallest amount of cells dying or getting damaged, which is what ends up happening with stroke. Um, so smallest amount of neuronal cells dying. There are Although this is not my area of expertise, this is my understanding, there are two ways in which you sort of regain some of the function. One way you regain function is the remaining neurons, whatever are present, are able to sort of recover enough and they're not injured enough, so over time they stabilize and then you have some function associated with them. The second thing which can happen is now there are so many circuits in the brain, some of them you might repurpose and use it slightly differently. So you can use a different part, a different part of the circuit and you bypass the requirement for those cells. What precisely will happen with each patient is very hard to tell. Right? But those are the typical ways in which recovery takes place after stroke. Thank you, ma'am. There's a related question with, uh, from Anusha R. She says, uh, now that treatments and therapies are so advanced in the field of medicine, what is the major reason that we still do not have a cure for neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's? I think <laughs> it's very <laughs> difficult. The problem is extremely difficult. You know, the success of human society is how well we have dealt with communicable diseases. We have antibiotics, of course, now we have antibiotic resistance to bacteria. We have vaccines, and we've done an excellent job. Anything to do with the brain, we are not doing as well as the job. We just are not. Cardiovascular diseases, we are doing amazingly well, right? Because you can go into surgery, you can clean up like a plumber all your arteries and remove all the gunk which is there. We have ways to treat blood pressure. Maybe they don't work perfectly, but they work. The best neurodegenerative disease 
Okay, I'll, I'll just give you this example. So people developed mouse models for human neurodegenerative diseases. There are some neurodegenerative diseases for ALS, for instance, you could ascribe that some number of them come from mutations in this protein called superoxide dismutase. So they made a mouse which had this uh, mutation which was seen in human patients. Then they said, oh, this is how much of the human cells, of whatever we see all these problems, do we see it in these rats? Allah Papa, it's all there. It's all looking really good. And they say, we now use the mouse and we will find drugs. We found drugs. Then you go and try uh, do a trial in humans. And the best case drug improved longevity for six months and maybe slow down progression by about six months. Which is great if you want to put your affairs in order, but in terms of really improving it, improving the outcome, not so good after all. Right, or six months. So I think there are multiple reasons why I say this. One is whatever drug you get has to cross the blood brain barrier. And that is not an issue. Because you want the blood brain barrier to work, but you want it to let this go. So that's one thing. Neurons don't regenerate themselves. Existing neurons have to be protected, or some kind of deficit has to be, you know, some kind of covered up. Third thing, we have a large number of neurons. Let's think of Parkinson's disease. By the time you see symptoms, you have already lost a large number of neurons. You need some kind of early detection for these people. So you don't even know. So you don't even find out that something is wrong until it's too late. And the brain is extremely complex. If any of you know people who have neuropsychiatric disorders, often the, there are some medicines. You know, they're old medicines. I think the SSRIs are the newest class of them, and there are a few others people are trying to catch them in the things of that nature. Lithium is a very, very old medicine that people are using. None of them act immediately, like the things that we see with communicable diseases. So whatever changes are happening in the brain, even when you have a therapeutic intervention in these kinds of diseases, is something which is slow, and we don't understand it all. So I think what is missing is fundamental understanding, but what is also missing is technological interventions where we can sort of deliver it in the right place, in the right amount, doing the right thing. So I think both of those put together have given rise to the difficulty of treating not only neurodegenerative disorder, but also things like severe epilepsy. If you have severe epilepsy, finally, what do they do? They go in and take out small pieces of the brain which are those four times. Just so, you know, if you think about it, why would you even, however small it is, why would you want to give up a part of your brain, which is obviously very important for doing the multiplicity of the complex tasks we see in our everyday life. So I think there are multiple, if you're thinking about doing research, this is a great area to go at time where probably frustration will be high, but impact can also be very high. Sandhya, there are three more questions here. Should yes. I ask them or uh, you want to go on to your talk? No, I can uh, answer them and then go on to it. Okay. Uh, so the question is, uh, who can be affected from Dondeti Divya? Divya is asking, ma'am, who can be affected by these kind of neurological disorders? Neurodegenerative diseases. See, or vice kumela ayachina dementia is almost a given at population level. Individuals you may escape, but at the population level, after a certain age, everybody will have some dementia. Everybody loses. And you know, this is lived experience. If you have seen your grandparents over 30 years and they are above 90 years, my grandmother is 100 years old. And I have seen her since she was, I think, I don't know, 50 that I definitely remember her. And she was 50. You can see that there is a decline. There's a decline in her ability to remember. There's a decline in her ability to cognitively process complex information. So I think it's inevitable that you have that. And I think that's too linked to aging. We still, majority of the neurodegenerative diseases are called sporadic. They arise in a sporadic manner. There is a small number which are genetically inherited, like the SOD mutation I told you for Parkinson, the LARP mutation that you see, the APP mutation. This is how you figured out that Alzheimer's cell come from mutations in the APP gene of each cell energy. Those are still a minority. 
in some cases it's not like that like huntington for instance comes from the huntington protein and from repeat expansion right so they do have one to one correlation but the majority of other kinds of things are sporadic and we have little understanding of what is going on really there are many hypotheses but they are not well substantiated there's another interesting question uh, from shankar narayanan can we use crispr cas9 to avoid parkinson's or some other neurodegenerative disease first of all so the please you want to try something like crispr cas9 or whatever like this genome engineering you would want to try in families which have had huntington's disease where you know one to one that gene is mutated they the repeat expansion is in a way in which you know for sure that at some point they are going to get a disease right so there are many ethical considerations here as well and of course i don't think the technology is there in a way in a cool proof manner that we can we can do that i think that we have still some distance to go but i think we can get that but as i said before the many of the neurological generators we we don't know what was we don't know the etiology right so where we know this one to one correspondence with the gene we can do something but if it is not what are we going to figure out how what will be task so those are the real difficulties of uh, doing using that up it will work in a subset of people won't we don't even know what to use it for in many other um this is uh, we can maybe go back to the yeah we, i can go back to so what i thought i would do with the rest of my time here if there is any is to actually share what the most important thing that you can think about in science is actually figuring things out and that's what scientists try to do we try to figure things out we try to understand what is happening so i sort of told you that neurons have these these long wire like connections by which they connect one neuron to another neuron or another muscle where you have output these long wire like connections are called axons which are written here as a and here i start with a story during world war 2 there were a lot of people who this was a time the first time in which there were a lot of planes used in war right and these planes crashed the design of the planes had not been standardized in fact there is this beautiful article that i just read a little time ago that many of the people who crashed you know had terrible burns and because they had those burns a lot of uh, you know wonderful things were figured out uh, techniques were developed for plastic surgery but the other thing which would happen to people who would fall this great distance were injuries spinal cord injuries and you must have heard about these terms paraplegic or uh, the people who you know stroke was one example which is a fairly common thing which as a population we have experienced with but you can have spinal cord injuries and be sort of stuck in a wheelchair for the rest of your life and for a lot of these people they were people in their early 20s so you looking at a life for several decades in which you were essentially in a very bad situation of your daily life so people started getting very interested in the nervous system especially they realized that neurons were not really growth so very different from this case so paul was a scientist in university of chicago he did this very elegant experiment and it's an experiment which any of us can do if you look at a garden hose you taking a garden hose and watering a plant you can take that garden hose and construct it if you construct it and you don't even know where the water is coming from you can easily tell if your garden hose tells up that oh no the tap must be connected to this end right likewise what paul rice did was he tied a little suture around neurons and various cats uh dogs uh, maybe even rats i think and then he waited several weeks and what he saw was these little swellings he tied it over here and he what he saw was little swellings that occurred on both sides so what he knew from that the flow of material was taking place in axon and the axon is not a static structure which has this uh, cytoskeleton which is microtubules and actin but actually things were moving so 
once you realize that there were things moving in it and we went into some discussion about why we study the nervous system and why it's important to figure out both for fundamental understanding as well as disease the next question which actually to uh, scientists can answer is how something works in fact most of the time a scientist is figuring out how something works and they try to design better and better experiments to illuminate that how something works okay so now that you know how things are you know that things can move inside inside neurons from that simple ligation experiment you want to figure out how to study that you want to figure out what is moving and one way to do that and you can do that and this is a movie of a c elegance that we have chosen where i talked about synaptic vesicles which are filled with neurotransmitters the chemicals that are released at the end of the neuron right so you attach the proteins which are present on them to green fluorescent proteins think of it as painting one all the auto rickshaws one color all auto rickshaws let us paint them yellow that means whenever you have a drone going in the air or you're flying in the aircraft you see yellow you know it's auto rickshaw likewise you take these synaptic vesicles you attach gfp to one of the proteins which is present on the synaptic vesicles and then you can see that they are present at places at these communication hubs that they are released and you can easily see them under the microscope you can then use a much higher powered microscope and here's again a c elegant again from my lab trap the animal turn on fluorescent light and then you see that oh my god now i'm looking at higher magnification and i can see that material is moving in both directions and some material is also not moving okay so obviously these painted cargo or marked cargo move and do in fact this turned out to be a collaboration that i had with a physicist so i'm a biologist i trained as you see first in the chemistry and biochemistry but i sort of went into really hardcore biology and um, what that was the physicist in imsc in chennai is a theoretical physicist who keep asking every time i showed him such movies why is it that nothing moves and after about the 10th time he asked me i felt ashamed that i could not give him a satisfactory answer and i said okay i will go and look up as to or do experiments to figure it out. and what we realized so when you look at this kind of moving i tell you what we found out but you can also take the same preparation where i showed you where things are moving and in from a different organism people sort of teased it apart you know so they spread everything out which is inside that axon of the neuron and what you can see is these are these cellular roots which is part of the cytoskeleton which i call those long long tip polymers called microtubules and you can see the transport of movement occurs in it. it's very very easy so microtubules are the cellular road on which carbon moves which is very akin to what you might see on highway traffic by any drone footage from any part of the world right in fact now we know from decades of work initially started by Scott Brady and Todd Bale and others that this movement takes place using proteins which are called motor proteins which walk on these polymers and they drag the cargo by binding okay and these molecular motors are very very important for movement so let's get that out of the way but these are these are exactly how things move inside all cells including in neuron so what did we find out the question we asked was are there traffic jams in neurons i already showed you that some cargo did not move right now if you are driving in mandavali market which my father sometimes does i know that if he is driving the car to forget it he is not going to have a clean shot through that space unless it is 3 am in the morning why because there is this mallipur seller some lamp seller some cycles are parked two motorcycles will stand in the corner and talk to each other standing in opposite direction so i think why they should do that i have no idea but that's what they do therefore the available space gets constricted 
So what happens in neurons? Are neurons like Indian roads? Do they have crowded places to which it's difficult for cargo to go past? In fact, it's not an unreasonable question to ask because these are the roads. So this is again looking at now electron microscope images. These are the roads. And you see, this is a big, you think of it as a big car and this is a small auto rickshaw which is behind it. And this could be the truck. It's actually a microphone. So you can have a lot of things which are close by in a neuron which give you crowding. This is also a different kind of cytoskeletal element. You can have big cargoes which are present over here, which can also prevent other things from going ahead. So if there's a big truck in front of you, then a small car which is behind you to get past. Is that what happens in neurons inside a living animal? To do this experiment, what I'm going to show you is that the crowded region, which is now crowded by cytoskeletal elements for action, also form these ring-like structures, are present. So we've labeled that to be, and we've labeled the synaptic vesicle which contains neurotransmitter in Z. And now what you will see, this movie will play again. In this crowded region, this vesicle will come and just stop. It will not be able to go ahead. In fact, we see that this kind of traffic jam seems to occur in niches in the axon, which is anyway very narrow. It is literally mandal market only, narrow, narrow road from the axon. It's not like the cell phone. It's very big and there's a lot of space in comparison. The axon is very narrow. So what we find is that cargo come to a halt and can form small traffic jams or congestion in these locations. Now, whether you are an Indian driver on crowded roads in some marketplace or you are in the neuron, you don't want these traffic congestions to last forever. You still have to get from place A to place B. In the neuron, you have to move your synaptic vesicles in both directions, as we saw in the movie in, in, inside the elephant. How can you do that? So doing computer experiments, so, so this is a different kind of experiment. You're all doing the experiment inside an animal, but here is a collaboration with a physicist who sort of takes the information that the biologist produces, develops a computer simulation, and let's see what the computer simulations tell us. What the computer simulations tell us is the following, that if a particular cargo does not make any decision. That is, it just goes in straight line and does not do anything. Eventually, everything and all cargo movement will come to a halt. Which is true even if you look at Indian drivers on Indian roads, right? Because if you just go and stand over there and don't do any decisions, eventually everything will start piling up behind you and you will not go ahead not possible. When can you, what are the strategies you can use? Are they local strategies or are they global strategies? And what you can see is that you can take a local decision to go on to another lane. So if you have a multi-lane road, for instance, and here in, in a neuron you have multiple microtubules, what you can do is shift either protofilament from a microtubule or shift to another microtubule and therefore make a local decision and start getting movement again or getting movement of car. This is called local decision in space. So you can have spatial relaxation of traffic jam. So there's one other thing the simulation suggested. The simulation suggested that you can go back and forth. That is, if you if you completely count it, you can reverse, go back, maybe do something else. If you're an Indian driver, you reverse, you park on the side, you go and do whatever is your local shopping, or you go to a tea shop and say, I'm going to drink some tea, or whatever it is. Or you just say, and then you go to the same region. So obviously, if your simulations are predicting that this is one strategy that neurons can use, you want to see what is happening inside the animal in a real neuron. So here is an example which I'm going to show you. The green is the crowded region. 
the red is the vesicle which has the neurotransmitter called synaptic receptors. And you can see that it is reversing. It comes up to a jammed area, it reverses, goes back, again, forward, back, forward, and eventually it will come out. So we call this temporal relaxation. That is, you can go through the same region which is crowded, but except you sample that space at a later time where locally things, the traffic may have released. This is much like saying looking at Google Maps and saying I'm already on the road, this is looking bad, so let me just go backwards and stop for a while and I'll come to the same road after some time where maybe the red has become red. Right? That's the kind of decision which potentially neurons make. So our work also suggests that this kind of crowding and the exist ability to do reversals might be very critical to maintain cargo flow. So what, what did we learn from the study? By doing relatively simple experiments, we figured out that traffic jams are a feature, not a bug. And if you're driving on Indian roads, traffic jams are a feature, not a bug. And we as drivers have to be very driven about. There is one unbreakable rule that if there is some jam in front of you, you cannot go ahead. There are many strategies by which you can bypass traffic jams. One is, and local decisions seem to be fair, seem to be sufficient, where you can change track or do reversals. And potentially these strategies are universal rules. Why are they universal rules? Because ants seem to use the same strategies. DNA moving on proteins seem to use similar strategies, and human drivers seem to use the same strategies. So across landscapes, we seem to find this to be the same. The work was done by various postdocs and students and a master's student. Kausalya works in a company. Parul is an entrepreneur now. She was a PhD student who graduated, and Keetana was a master's by research student who is now doing her PhD. Uh, in KU Leuven, between KU Leuven and Oxford. Here was my theoretical physics collaborator, Gautam, who is now in Ashoka. And I will come to reading lists. There are two kinds of reading lists that I suggested. One which is fun and sort of brings, is a story, which also brings in how you can conduct a medical and scientific investigation, which is a book called Brain on Fire, but is also being made into a movie called Brain on Fire, which is available, I gather, on Netflix. And it, oh, can you still see my slide? No, actually, no. Oh, okay, I don't know what happened. Now, can you see my slide? Yes, okay. yes. In which, essentially, one class of receptors called NMDA receptors are attacked in by antibodies and therefore the whole neuron sort of you know all the neurons in which these receptors is widespread lead to very complex phenotypes and this also illustrates what the problem is here do you know what the antibody is against which protein and what the role of that protein is nonetheless it took a really long time for diagnosis and there were very complex phenotypes that you had um, I think you, I won't do it. I think it's well worth seeing the movie and well worth reading the book and having some discussions about it. It sort of brings home the complexity of treating um, disorders of the brain of whatever that. The other set of reading I have is actually, I think the best thing any of you can do is watch or read the Nobel lecture to ask or do the Nobel lecture. So the first of them is from very long ago. I briefly mentioned Ramoni Kahal and Camillo Golgi, where they got the prize for the structure of the nervous system. And I also, if you ever get into this, I also want you to read it because science is done by human beings, okay? And Camillo Golgi is so upset because he felt that even though he got the Nobel Prize, which is about the biggest prize you can get in science, he felt that his ideas were not accepted, right? He said, he essentially, he, was, he felt that his ideas did not 
gain traction and so the entire nobel lecture is where he is trying to argue that he is the guy right. and there are many reasons why at that time he was thought that was unlikely that what his findings uh, were but he developed the staining method which uh, ramune kahal used very successfully and subsequently we know that kahal is right for multiple independent theory then the lot of nobel prizes is only a subset of them which have been given to understanding the brain and john eccles allen hodgkin and andrew huxley discovered the ionic mechanisms of excitation and inhibition with its essentially electrical flow which is very very important near and sarkman amazing work that was the first time people were able to look at single molecules and see how they function single protein complexes so they developed the uh, patch clamp method where they could now follow the behavior of single ion channels the first time it had ever been done that you could look at any protein at that level of resolution and of course bernard katz julius axon or then von buller looked at how neurotransmitter storage release in inactive take place which is really seminal because they also realized that you know single vesicles were releasing that there was quantum release beautiful work and in this next prize which is Randy Shekman Jo James Rothman and Tom Sudoff Tom Sudoff is the neurobiologist the other people are more cell biologists he's a neuronal cell biologist Tom Tom Sudoff's work actually talks about the molecule molecules which are involved in releasing neurotransmitter at the same time and more recent i thought give something completely different and fun is more recent nobel prize david julius and ardan patapotian where they found receptors for temperature and touch which are also involved in pain which is very very important so these are my suggestions to all of you i think the nobel lectures are a great series and a great way to get into neurobiology and there's so many of them this is a small subset there are few more which are equally interesting but these are related to how individual neurons function rather than how circuits and things like that function so i hope you some of you pick this up but even if you don't take up this deep seated reading please do consider watching brain on fire on netflix or reading the book which is available on amazon and i shall end now thank you thank you so much sandhya i uh, i had a question when you were talking about you spoke about collaborating with a physicist uh, and you're yeah. a neurobiologist so how does this collaboration between two people from two different disciplines kind of come up and talk about that to them so i think for me individually i okay with specifically with with i have had a lot of different interdisciplinary collaborations gautam is just one of them i've had with chemists like yamuna experimental physicists like venka to know for developing microfluidic devices which i actually showed today in the talk i think sometimes for me it has always been oh this is a really cool thing so with 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 the chemistry it was like oh you're developing a really cool tool that can address these kinds of questions which i'm interested in shall we try it out it was just a sense of adventure and it got them also to the sense of adventure you know because i think what you do when you speak to i mean for instance what vijay asked you know what is the what is the range of electricity is not something that i think about right i mean i need to think about coming up with an answer which which was satisfactory for him and i think that's what is really good when you speak to people who are outside your area of research because they force you to think about the problem in different ways which you may not have considered and it i am telling you that is the easiest way to do it otherwise it's so much harder right you just go and speak to someone who doesn't know what you do ask them questions they ask you questions and you say oh my god i didn't think about this and i need to think about it so that's how it started you need to have i think uh, gautam and i once wrote about this in india by science you both need to have confidence and you need to have a sense of adventure i think you should not worry immediately we are lucky that we work in india where everything is not driven by how much time we have so you can say that oh let me just experiment and let me go and see if something comes out of it maybe nothing will but it's well worth the effort and in fact to be honest every interdisciplinary collaboration i've got got into has been a learning experience in terms of 
either now having a tool that I can use or a different way of thinking about the problem. And I think with Gautam, it has really informed our science in, in a very way. Thank you. Uh, is there any other question that anyone in the program wants to ask or uh, anyone in YouTube, you can also put your questions in the chat box and it will be conveyed here. So if there's any question, would you please type it out in the chat box, please? Another uh, question I had was, uh, you are using this uh, C. elegans as a model organism, but different uh, scientists use different model organisms. Uh, how is this, uh, how do you zero in on a particular organism for a particular study? That depends on the problem you want to address, right? If you want to study vision, C. elegans is the wrong organism to look at. It doesn't have eyes, it doesn't have vision in the classic sense, right? So obviously then you need to study an organism which has that sensory modality and it is very important. The elegance has been used for olfaction because its smell is a very important component of its, its life cycle and its existence. So that's how one of the key ways in which it interacts with the world. For me personally, for the problems I study, I always thought the elegance was very suitable because it's transparent. I'm looking at cell biology of neurons. I like to see how things move inside neurons. Then you can it's transparent so you can just look at it there are other considerations when people look at model systems that is how many tools are available which is directly related to what size of the community is right because the, the community has to be large enough for people who are tool builders how expensive it is to run the elegant cheap compared to compared to even drosophila it's definitely compared to rats and mice which are you know in some ways closer to what humans are that's what they are and for some people, like if you're interested in looking at, um, you know, mood disorders, you can't use the elegance. Maybe you can use them for cellular mechanisms. But uh, it's a fair question to ask, do mice get depressed or are they schizophrenic? But there are at least certain behavioral changes which you think can sort of map on to the behavioral changes that you see in room. So it really depends on the problem that you've picked and whether the system is addressed to answer questions, right? So just like I said, how do you figure it out? I said, you figure it out by attaching the AP, you look at this imaging, then you label various cargo, and then you look at it, right? So I sort of built that question up in part. You have to be able to do that. Otherwise, you can ask, oh, I think biology is filled with people who can, you can ask wonderful questions in biology, only a subset, tiny fraction of them you can experimentally address. And that is important. That's the key. Did you face any problems when, uh, during lockdown, when you had to maintain these uh, organisms and so on? We did. First of all, the good thing about sea elegance is you can freeze them and they can stay in liquid nitrogen and you can thaw them out when you need them. But lockdown was so sudden and people just left. They all went home. We had like two people, including me, and we had a hundred strains to freeze. And we got contaminated with mice. It was very difficult. <laughs> But we managed. We sat and froze every single thing. Even I was doing it, along with Ayush Asti. And at some point, Ayush Asti became so much I was not able to help. With two people who were there in the lab, essentially, especially one of them, just lifted the boat and tried to lift the boat into the lab. Yeah, we did have a now We had also something where we could not get liquid nitrogen, you know, because the lift had stopped working and we couldn't get somebody to repair. <laughs> so, you know, you can't even bring the tank up. So, you know, you can only carry so much liquid nitrogen from the other thing because the other lift could not take the lay. And how many times will you go up and down? So, you had to fill it over a whole two weeks. Slowly, you filled it up. By the time you filled it up, the other tank was gone. Oh. <laughs> there are lots of difficulties. There are a few questions now from yeah. the audience. Uh, Ma'am, are snail majorly used? for neuron study than C. elegans? So snails, for instance, they said for each model system that you use, you need to have tools, you need to have a community which is using it to study various other problems. So for instance, C. elegans is a great genetic model. So you can make transgenics, you can get mutants, you can do CRISPR-Cas9, all kinds of things, right? And there's a whole community of them using it to study different problems. 
snail less so. So I think there are one or two studies in snails that people do, but most of the studies will be done in sea elephants or Drosophila or mice or rats, so zebra fish. There is value and there's been a lot of electrophysiological type of things done on electrical fish, on squid, um, on lobsters, on crabs, but those are recordings where you can just poke it and record. Once you need genetic kind of manipulation and you want to label different parts, you want to do that with cellular neurobiology, and you want to study a question to cellular neurobiology, you shift to modern systems where there is already a computer. If it is recording, anybody can typically if the organism, and there you will see many of those organisms are very large. Squid is large, and squid is large. Crabs are large. And people will record from that because it's easier in those larger systems to record. But it's very hard to get them to breed because you're catching them from the wild. You don't have uniformity of behavior. So all of that. Comes up. That question was from Nidhi. The next question is from Shankar Narayan again who is asking, can we transplant neurons that get damaged? I mean transplant of neurons than from chemical culture, from stem cell culture. culture. So I think you can now uh, differentiate neurons in vitro and people are trying that. Uh, how will you transplant? Do they really form branches? There are also some stem-like cells um, near the ventricles of the brain and you know that they can migrate and differentiate. But still, we don't have a good understanding of how you'll get it to integrate with the circuit. And here, remember the picture that I showed about the complexity of the nervous system, of every individual neuron. So if you want to replace a neuron, which is died or been damaged, you want to replace it with its full arbor. Tall order. We haven't figured it out yet. We might in principle know this is the how the it will grow out, this is how it will pass fine, but in the local region what it will do, we will not know. So we have not reached that point yet. But it's, it's something that everybody is thinking about. It's not as if it's not a problem that people aren't thinking about. Nice. So any more questions? Anyone else Could wants look should we look in YouTube to see if someone has posted uh, They haven't posted, it seems. I've been checking uh, oh, okay. that. Right now, there are no questions in YouTube. But uh, yeah, YouTube uh, YouTubers, please, uh, you can also post questions. And uh, anyone here wants to ask any question, you can type in the chat box. Meanwhile, the reading material you've given are very interesting and uh, it's a yeah i mean i think the i think the nobel lectures are a great resource and generally those talks are set up so that even people without a lot of background can understand and and i think that's why it's very important so it's a good entry point into the literature and those scientists and their work itself becomes a place where in which you can enter the literature and find something which is more decent and look at things. And listeners, uh, when you if you if you are interested in biology, you can ask uh, Dr. Yeah, Kuka. if you have career-related questions, that uh, Neuralink works. I I have no opinion on Neuralink at all, at all. I don't know enough to have it. What so is Neuralink? I don't know that. Uh, what is this? Thing? Shankar Narayanan can explain. Ah, okay. uh, ma'am. Uh, it's Elon Musk company, uh, yes. majorly <laughs> doing a works on uh, nervous system to. They, uh, they can implant chips in the brain and. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, there is not enough information about what they have done. So for me as a scientist, you even take a judgment call. How do I get a start? Um, in how can we get a uh, constructive career in neuroscience? Yeah. So I would say that <coughs> this is what I tell people who want to, who are interested in biology, especially neuroscience, I would recommend. I would say that the single biggest thing you should do is not run away from quantitative stuff. So make sure your math, your physics, all of that is very good. Some of the finest neuroscientists are people who are physicists, engineers, 
uh, people from more theoretical background because there's a lot of computational neuroscience which I have not talked about. And more and more microscopy requires you to use quantitative approaches. And in fact, a lot of cell biology has itself become quantitative. So if I had to give one piece of advice to people, don't run away from those quantitative approaches. Aside from that, I think just read, enjoy yourself. And if you do a PhD, then that is the time I think you should engage. Don't specialize too early because you don't know what will capture your interest. But when you, if you decide to do a PhD and go in that direction, then you pick a lab which is working on problems that you are interested in and is hopefully also a good place to do work. That would be my single piece of advice to everybody. Don't run away from quantitative. I have a personal question to you. you. You did chemistry and then biochemistry and then you are now in neurosciences. Can yes. you describe that journey a little bit? How you changed? Uh, it didn't seem like a change. It was very organic. So I think that I was, when I was very young, I, you know, that was the time when people would talk about genetics and other things. And there were, there were people, there were children who had neurodevelopmental diseases and in fact, two brothers in a family. So there must have been a genetic component. And it was, you know, it seemed like these would be interesting problems to look at. And I was told by somebody I don't remember anymore that if you want to do anything biology, you should have good chemistry. So after my 12th, I said I didn't want to do medicine or any of those things. I went and did chemistry. Um, and to be honest, I also messed up my application. So even if I wanted to do medicine, my form only was not submitted. So good job. <laughs> Or one of them, I don't remember which, but some some guy, but half of it was there. It's now too many decades ago. And then when I did chemistry, I always knew that I then wanted to do some sort of biological sciences and address questions in biology. Not that I didn't enjoy the chemistry, I did. I, I liked it. It was a good good. So then when I had to do an MSc, I applied. MSc University is well known for its biological science with master's courses. So I applied to MS University Biochemistry. I lived in that city. It was natural for me to apply. I got in. I was happy to have got it. And it was really my first exposure to somewhat modern biology, which was very nice. But for me, personally, the training point was when I went to do a summer trip to CCMD, where I was really exposed to what is my modern biology, because even though they were working on DNA and things like that, some promoters and things like that. At, it was in that place, there was actually a journal club run by a few people who were there. One of them is a scientific officer, but others who went on then to become director of PCMD, but they were also graduate students. And I realized, oh, developmental biology is so interesting. And I came back and I'm going to study that. I didn't understand anything. Okay? It just sounded very cool. And Rotopila looked very good. So then I applied to graduate school while I was finishing university with an idea to do developmental biology, but the lab I ended up in worked on Drosophila, which sounded very interesting and what I wanted to work, but was working on neurons. And then that love affair began and it never ended. Oh, that's a really nice story. Thanks. There are so, some questions that have come up now. Uh, yeah. Mahim Dave asks, uh, what are the consequences when traffic managing in neurons goes haywire? That's an excellent question. In fact, that's a piece of data that I did not show. So we asked this question by looking at a C. elegans model of a neurodegenerative disease, which is called tau um, where we sort of using this model increased what we think we have done is increased crowding in the neuron. Right? So it is an old observation at this point in time that in neurodegenerative models, Compared to healthy neurons or aged match neurons, however healthy they are, you can, you can, but at least not apparently diseased, you will find that cargo flow is slower or stopped. Less cargo flows or much more is stopped. So there are two ways in which this can happen. One way is that you have much more crowding. So you have many more of these Mandavali market like, you know, things which are just coming and 
filling up gap. That is one possibility. The second possibility is that the ability to do this reversal or to change the track, that is lost. Okay. What we found was that cargo flow reduced in this crowded model, this disease model. We also saw number of traffic jams increased. And what the simulations have shown that if you messed up with reversals or ability to change tracks, I showed you that you would have traffic jams which were resolved. At the same time, reversals had also been. So in fact, there was a small increase in reversals taking place before there was an increase in traffic jams. So we think that reversals might be very important, or that mechanism might be very important for making sure cargo flows in a neurodegenerative disease model and maybe that mechanism doesn't work properly due to other reasons and therefore overall cargo flows and therefore traffic jam goes up. Okay, that's what we think right now. There's an interesting question from uh, Baraniya. Can I become an astronaut after becoming an MBBS? I don't know. I don't know how you become an astronaut, but you should find out. I'm, I don't see any reason why anybody who's healthy can do that very tough training, cannot become an astronaut. But I'm sure like everything else in our country, there'll be a pipeline, some exam, some this, that would be there. <laughs> That's how our country works. <laughs> but I honestly don't. Aditya wants to know, ma'am, what is the scope for MSc in molecular biology and human genetics? So I, you know, there are jobs to be had directly after an MSc as well. There are wide variety. You can go to companies. You can go to work in labs as well. Many people go and work for short periods of time to decide if a PhD is right for you. Then they take on you know, science related, try and approximate things like, you know, marketing or sales of products because they understand what laboratory needs are. Some people go into science entrepreneurship, some people go into science education. It really does not matter what your MSc is. I always say, figure out what is it that you like to do, at least what is it that you don't like to do. Because then you will know, okay, those I don't want to do and then try out what you can and see where those open and step forward. I mean, my whole life it's been put one step in front of the other and see what opportunities come up and keep trying. Do the things you like, keep trying, something will come. Do you believe then that uh, if you like to do something, then you will do your best for it? One tries, I think. I think the motivation is higher when you like to do something, certainly. Um, but people are so variable and situations are so variable so it's not even if you like it you may not be in a situation where you can actually do much about it so those things also occur so i think that's such an individual thing very difficult to have control there's a question from shankar narayan i have a general doubt right now i'm doing a master's in zoology my interest in cell and molecular biology but i am la lacking in lab skills is it advisable to pursue phd I strongly suggest for everybody who wants to do a PhD to get a little bit of a research internship. So here's my statement. Anybody can do a PhD. You can take a normal 12th standard student and put them, they can also do a PhD. Even 10th standard student can do a PhD. Anybody can do a PhD. But research as a career path is not for everyone. It's very repetitive. There's a lot of failure. You need resilience. You need to be okay in biology labs to work with a large number of diverse people. There are skills you need to learn to write. Communication is super important. So if you like all of the components, not j and of course you have to like to do the experiments. I always tell my students, you can't feel excited about doing a thousandth mini prep to make the same bloody construct. Okay? You just can't be excited about it. You know, it's a lot of repetition. But if the larger goal is something, despite going through that treadmill, is something that excites you, you have to decide what is it that you want to work hard for. Everybody has to work hard. All careers are different. But get that research experience that you can. Because I think it will tell you if that is something which speaks to you. 
after doing a PhD, if someone changes their mind about pursuing a research career, is that possible? Yeah, why not? Very easy. In fact, easier and easier as time goes by. In fact, majority of the people who get a PhD don't necessarily end up in academia. A fraction of them will get up in industry, but more and more there are many, which is also research career for some time at least, although there could be a management track that people get into. But there's a huge diversity of careers that can be taken up after a PhD. Uh, but the PhD itself, if you look at Twitter and other social media, you can see that there are struggles associated with it. So go into it if that's really something that excites you and fits with your life goals and careers. Uh, Aditya wants to ask, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, we, we are at 5.45 now. There is a science question. Is, is the study of something? I can't. Yeah, I am currently pursuing BSc in biotechnology. Is it advisable to pursue cross degree in other life sciences courses? It really doesn't matter. Just make sure that the fundamentals are strong. You know, if I think about absolute basics, you know, like quantitative stuff, you know, and you're not afraid of, you know, dealing with those kinds of questions, your basic statistics is good, your basic biochemistry is good, your basic molecular biology and genetics are good. If you have what I call the foundation laid well, it doesn't matter what you say. Would anyone like to speak with the speaker? Uh, any, want so here is a question. Is the study of forward and reverse cargo movements based near, merely on observation or can it be measured quantitatively? If yes, how is it measured quantitatively? Of course, microscopy is observation. All experiments are observation. So we all, all, all experiment is an observation. You, you observe and then you do a manipulation and you observe again. That's how experiments are. That's what we try to do. Can it be measured quantitatively? Absolutely. In fact, that's what we do. I didn't show you the quantitative data because it is not fit in terms of a outreach type process, but that's exactly what we do. We get a wealth of quantitative data. In fact, the simulations that were done were benchmarked to gobs and gobs of quantitative data that we got. So we can calculate what are the fraction of vesicles that move in one direction. What are the fraction of vesicles that move in the other direction? What are the speeds? What are the distances they move? How often do they stop? How long do they stop? How, how many of them reverse? How far do they travel if they reverse? So they mark some of the parameters you can extract from them. So you essentially can convert that movie into what is called a kalmograph which is a distance time plot. Every image of the frame of the movie is converted into a black and white spot. So there you see cargo, you see black spot. If it moves, you see that the slope line. If it doesn't move, it see that the slope line. If it reverses, it will do this. So every bit of it can be extracted. Yeah. Uh, that's all the questions right now. Anyone else has any question? Would you like to come, come up and speak? You can also do that. You don't always have to type it in the chat box. <coughs> Are there any questions from YouTube? Hello, ma'am. Yeah, yes. someone. Please identify yourself and then. Hello? No questions, and I said no from YouTube. Oh, no questions. Okay. Uh, hello, ma'am. I am Nidhi. Actually, I am currently pursuing biotechnology. Uh, so, how hard is it to get your admission in TIFR? And how hard is how it to get admission in TIFR? Is that the question? Yeah, how hard is it to get your admission so, in TIFR? So I don't, I can't speak to how hard it is. I can just give you some numbers. We have, I think we have several thousand people, maybe close to 10,000 people who take the JG Wills exam, which is conducted by TFR and some other institutions, I think ISA, Pune and other places, also use the same exam. The exam is con conducted by uh, TFR. 
and anyway between we call anyway between between our integrated phd program and a phd program we interview anywhere in our department we interview about maybe 2 to 50 200 to 250 people maximum so already that big thousands of people is cut down um so very small number based on based on the marks in jhsl which has quantitative section by the way physics and chemistry high school high school stuff not anything complicated and then we also look at what statement of purpose you write in terms of your research proposal so do some scanning look at your letters of recommendation there is another stream that we have we which we get very few people who people who already have significant research experience we used to ask for one year in the same lab who also had very high cut off same gate and csi so i don't think it's impossible but it's not very easy so it's just because there are very large number of people and we have to say no to a lot of challenges let's see because it's not possible on that day also how your performance so we have a two stage interview that's the just just calling <coughs> and we have a first interview which is like a screening interview which is about 25 to 30 minutes and we have a longer interview if you make it to the first round which is closer to an hour and then we base the time based on that it depend on how many people we want to take that year how many we may want to take only five six people and how many we want to take 10 12 people so you're looking at you know people 10000 people taking that exam and in the end something like maybe 10 people so lots of thank you sporing in in the chat boxes that was a very enlightening session is there any other question or else we can go to thank the speaker and wind up we'll just wait for a minute if anyone wants to put in their questions or speak up you're welcome I think we've reached the end of our questions, Sandhya. And uh, thank you very much, all of you, for coming, especially on a Sunday. It is such a lovely experience to have you uh, chat about neurosciences, and uh, all the questions were fascinating and shows the interest of the students in biology. And uh, it's been really inspiring to have you here today. Thank you so much for making time for us and uh, giving this wonderful lecture today. Thank you. Thank you.